Okay, so this mini lecture is going to cover the individual differences in the timing of puberty, what factors contribute to those individual differences, and then also how individuals react to the timing of puberty themselves. Okay, so what are the difference, the con contributing factors to the individual differences in the timing of puberty? Well, heredity is always going to be partly responsible. Right, and uh, if you look at monozygotic twins, they will often reach uh, menarche within a month or two of each other, whereas dizygotic twins differ by as much as 12 months. Right, so there's probably something genetic going on there. In terms of nutrition and exercise, you need to have 15% body fat to menstruate regularly. So girls that are very thin, either because they train athletically um, very seriously or they just don't eat very much, they're very thin because they eat very little and have a small uh, percentage of body fat, they will often show delayed menstruation. On the other hand, girls that are overweight will tend to start menstruating early. And your book talks about why this might be. It's uh, perhaps because the fat cells in the body release a protein called leptin and leptin is probably involved in signaling the brain that the girl's body is ready in terms of her energy stores to support puberty and to support menstruation in particular. Now in terms of um, regions of the world, in poverty stricken regions, um, if you look at geographical location, where you have malnutrition and infectious disease being widespread, menarche is greatly delayed. There are uh, parts of Africa where the average age of menarche is uh, from 14 to 17. So that's quite a bit delayed from what we see in an industrialized nation like the United States. In terms of socioeconomic status, uh, girls that are from higher income families tend to reach menarche 6 to 18 months earlier than those living in economically disadvantaged homes. Um, in terms of family experiences, your book talks about, this is really interesting, that girls that are exposed to family conflict tend to reach menarche early versus those with warm family ties reach menarche later. So why would that be? And, and one possible explanation is an evolutionary uh, perspective that perhaps if you have lots of family conflict that signals danger, that the, that the body is at risk. And if you look at the, from an evolutionary perspective, the goal of the species is survival, right? And so if you're at risk, then it may be adaptive in terms of sur survival of the species to reproduce early. Who knows, right, if that's really what's going on, if there's just some other kind of biological explanation, but it's interesting to think about. Now, in terms of um, secular trend, what this means is that there's been generational change in the onset of puberty um, across historical time. In industrialized nations, the age of menarche has um, declined steadily. It declined steadily from 1860 to 1970 by about three to four months per decade. Why is that? What is it that really changed during that time? Well, we saw lots of improvement in nutrition, uh, improvements in health care and sanitation and control of infectious disease. And so we had the um, earlier onset of menarche. Now, we haven't continued to see those secular gains, which is a good thing. We wouldn't want to continue to see the onset pushed earlier and earlier. So it's pretty much slowed down or stopped in developed countries like the United States, but in other places where they're starting to see improvement in some of these areas, they might start to show these secular trends as well. So what is the typical reaction to puberty? Um, really it comes down to how much information do you have in advance and how much support do you have. So girls um, will tend to react with surprise, um, they definitely react more positively than they did in the past, probably because girls um, today have information uh, about menarche. In the 1950s, you had up to 50% of girls given no warning about this. So can you imagine, right, um, as a female having no information about this, no warning about what is about to take place, and then uh, you have menarche, how would you react to that? It's going to be much more negative <laughs> and anxiety ridden if you don't have information. And currently, you know, we don't have very many girls that are uninformed because a lot of this information at the very least gets passed on in the school setting. 
but also we have parents that tend to be a little bit more open to discussing sexual matters and puberty with their um, children than before. So the more preparation, the more information you have, the better off you are as a female. And there's also some research suggesting that father's involvement helps, that perhaps um, father involvement signals a family context that is supportive for physical and sexual matters, and, and that helps the child to adjust to what can be a difficult transition. For boys, it's a different story. Um, they have more mixed reactions, and that's because um, few actually know about spermarchy ahead of time. They don't really get information from their parents about this. Once it happens, a lot of boys don't talk to anyone about it. They don't ask uh, anyone about it, so they don't get as much social support or information ahead of time. If they do get preparation, if they do have social support, then that helps in adjusting to this change. Um, but in general, you know, we don't really talk about this a whole lot or give a lot of formal recognition to the onset of puberty in our society. Um, there are cultures that do. In many tribal and village societies, puberty is actually celebrated with a rite of passage kind of um, celebration. And imagine, you know, what your adjustment would be, what your reaction would be to puberty in a community like that. Um, but in Western societies, we don't really grant formal recognition of puberty. Um, we don't even grant uh, adult status or, you know, and there's no kind of rite of passage or transition that takes place as a result of going through puberty. Now, in terms of the timing of puberty, there are some consequences that uh, have been re researched in terms of whether you're an early mature or a late mature, and it turns out that the patterns are a little bit different for girls and boys. If you are an early maturing girl, then you tend to be less popular, you tend to be more withdrawn, you ha tend to have less confidence, um, you tend to be more psychologically stressed, you have a negative body image, you have um, more long-term problems in general. So why is that? Um, it could be that uh, you don't fit in with your peers as well, um, it could be that you get a lot of attention for looking physically different, right? If you think about early, an early maturing girl, girls are maturing early to begin with in comparison to boys, and then being an early maturing girl is really going to set you apart from your peers. And so we see these kind of maladaptive outcomes in early maturers. For boys, it's a different story. If you're an early maturing boy, this seems to be advantageous. Um, you tend to be more popular, more confident, more independent. You tend to have a positive, positive body image. Why is that? Well, think about it. We talked before about male groups and the formation of the dominance hierarchy. If you're an early mature and you're taller than all of your peers, that's going to have a role to play in that dominance hierarchy, and, and this um, gives you a good standing. And so it's actually a positive thing uh, early on for boys to be those early matures. And then if you look at late matures, it's kind of the opposite that late maturing girls tend to be more popular, more sociable, more outgoing, they tend to have more leadership positions, they have more positive body image, and late maturing boys, it's the opposite, right? They're more um, unpopular, more anxious, and have a negative body image. So let's talk for a second uh, more about why this might be. Right, so um, in terms of girls, if physical attractiveness is probably uh, playing a part in terms of body image. Girls want to be thinner and smaller, right? Thinking about that thin ideal in our society, boys want to be bigger. And so that makes sense that you're going to have this different adjustment to being an early maturing uh, girl versus an early maturing boy. And then um, you also want to fit in with your peers. And as a child, you tend to prefer a similar level of physical maturity in terms of who you spend your time with. And so what ends up happening is um, early maturing boys and girls in the long term both tend to have actually some problems. So even though early maturing boys early on seem to have some um, advantages, in the long run they don't um, do much better than girl, early maturing girls do. Both tend to um, engage in some uh, risky behaviors earlier, right? If you think about it, if you want to fit in with your peers and you're an early mature, you're going to be spending time with 
older peers. And those older peers are probably going to be more likely to be engaging in risky behaviors. And that means that the early mature is going to be exposed to the things at an earlier age and therefore have greater risk in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, the kinds of behaviors that they might get themselves into, sexual activity, drug and alcohol use, delinquent acts, um, poor school performance, right? And so there, this is going to promote early, um, earlier participation in activities that the younger adolescents, even though they're an early physical mature, might not be emotionally ready for.